In this video, we're gonna cover the full sales process to sell anything to anybody. This is actually video number seven in the Advanced Selling Techniques series. We're gonna splice over to the full training right now. So for quick context, my name is Cole Gordon. I wasn't always the uh, owner of Closer.io, which is regarded as a leading sales training and recruiting company in the high ticket space. Uh, in fact, in 2016, 2017, I had just you know failed with my business and gotten into sales by necessity. And even though I was uh, new to sales, I was a business owner. I thought it was going to be really good. I thought I was going to crush it, knock it out of the park. But I was the worst sales rep on the team. And uh, I'll never forget in 2016 or 17, in November, it was about 16, 17 days through the month, and I had zero sales. And so my sales manager sat me down and we kind of had one of those conversations like, hey, you know, you got to get this together or we're going to boot you off the team. And so out of desperation and out of necessity, I binged all the calls of the top reps on the team, which is one of the great benefits of sales, right? Is it's so easy to access what good performance looks like. And I was so grateful and lucky to be a part of a team with amazing sales reps on it. And so as I was binging all these calls of the top reps on the team who were closing people just left and right, what I expected to find was all this objection handling and objection jujitsu and sales closing and these tactics and like pressure at the end and all of this stuff. Like I was looking for like, what do I say at the end when they say they want to think about it to get them to buy? And what I found was that none of their people were giving them the objections at the end. And it wasn't because they had better leads. It was because what they were great at that I wasn't good at was not objection handling, but objection prevention. And all great salespeople share this trait. So what happened is really after discovering that, I turned it around, had a great November, finished second on the team, and then ended that team. Um, I spent about a year on that team, ended there as one of the top sales reps, not the top sales rep on the team, then went to another team, became the top rep. Another team went, became the top rep before I started Close.io. And really after all of that experience and after 3,000 plus calls, I created a framework that allowed me to have a tremendous amount of success and it's called the Belief Blueprint. So what that is, is basically there's seven beliefs the prospect needs to have to buy, okay? Which means also there's seven limiting beliefs that keep them from buying. So what you want to do in your conversation is have it in such a way where you're breaking down the seven limiting beliefs that keep them from buying and, and installing the empowering beliefs that will make them buy. And you want to do that before you transition to the close, okay? And if you do that, what's going to happen is instead of having to hard close the prospect, you're going to create an objectionless close to where they're closing themselves. And in doing so, they view you as a leader, not a salesperson. And what's really key to know about this is all great salespeople and all great sales scripts, they follow the seven beliefs, whether they're saying they are or not. Okay. So a lot of the, you know, maybe you follow Grant Cardo, maybe you follow, follow Jordan Belfort, maybe you follow another sales trainer out there, or maybe you know a really great salesperson who's really, really great at what they're doing, but they can't really explain what they're doing. They follow these seven beliefs. These seven beliefs can be transmuted and really uh, overlay any great sales process that's out there, okay? They have to have these seven beliefs to buy. So this presentation is gonna be about how to leverage those. What are those beliefs and how to actually install them in your sales call? So what we're gonna call, or what we're gonna cover is the seven beliefs, how to build them, and then the entire sales process. So we're kind of starting from a philosophy standpoint, like how to think about sales. And then we're gonna talk, chuck it down one level, talk about how to build them up. And then we're actually to go through specific scripting. But what's really key here is if I can get you one thing out of this presentation, I want you to get you the right way of thinking, right? One of my mentors always told me, if you can learn the right philosophy, if I can teach you how to think, the tactics will show up and come through you as a byproduct of that, right? All because you have the right mental models, all because you have the right thinking to begin with. Does it make sense? Cool. So what are the beliefs, right? There's pain, doubt, cost, desire, money, support, trust. So Pain means they have to have a problem or a gap. We'll talk about what that is in a second. Doubt means there has to be an inability to fix the problem. All right. So if you ever had, so if you don't have pain, if there's no gap between where they are now to where they want to be, they're not going to need it or they're not going to want it at the end of the call. If there's no doubt, they're going to think that they can fix this on their own. So if you ever had a sales call that ended with, yeah, I, I, you know, this sounds really good. I just want to, um, I just want to fix, you know, I just want to try this myself and see if it works before I get to the, uh, before I even come back and try this. Okay. Now, if you have a software or you have, you know, there's certain offers out there that doubt is just built in by the offer, right? Like you're probably not going to, you know, you're not going to try to build your own CRM. So sometimes this is just there, right? But it's, it's there nonetheless. 
in services or in coaching, this is a big one, right? The next one is cost, okay? Which means the cost of doing nothing, the cost of inaction, the cost if this problem continues to go on and get worse and nothing changes has to be greater than the cost in the form of time, energy, money, attention, reputation, everything in doing your offer or buying your program, right? And it has to be exponentially greater. It has to uh, cross a threshold. So the easiest way to think about cost is what's going to happen if the thing changes? Why is this important now? Those are the type of questions. We'll talk about that later, the right way to ask those, but those are the, the type of questions that elicit cost, okay? And so if, uh, you know, a great example of cost is Tony Robbins, if you've ever been to UPW, he has people, he takes people through what's called the Dickens process. And it's where you think about something that's not going the way you want it to in your life right now. And you basically visualize that problem if nothing changes and it gets even worse of where you're going to be at in five years, where you're going to be at in 10 years. Like what's the worst case scenario? What's going to happen if nothing changes? What if this problem continues to snowball, right? And what he's doing is he's building leverage in you to take action on doing the thing that's going to actually fix the problem now, right? Because a lot of times we do things for short-term benefit, not necessarily long-term benefit, okay? And so visualizing and really installing and building leverage of what's going to happen if nothing changes allows you to bring that back to the present moment and take action now. So it's very similar in sales. You just have to build leverage on your prospects. And that's not leverage to use against them. That's leverage for them to use on themselves. The next one is desire, which is the compelling payoff of fixing the problem. Then there's money, which is the resources and willingness to fix the problem. So desire, real fast, I didn't actually get to this point, but desire, compelling payoff to fix the problem. If they don't have that, then they're going to want to change, but they're not going to be oriented in a certain direction. So they're going to have analysis by paralysis. Okay. So there's a, a, a famous study done by um, the guy who wrote Influence, Robert Cialdini, and he talks about how there was two signs I think it was like a sign or an advertisement or, or something along those lines. And one was just talking about what's going to happen if you don't have vaccines. And the other was going to, was talking about what's going to happen if you don't have vaccines and what to do to be able to get all the vaccines needed. Now it's kind of obvious, but the one that actually had both, which was away from and towards and really uh, hit on the desire had an exponentially higher response than the one that didn't. And in fact, the one that just talked about how bad not having them are basically had no response whatsoever. So I'm kind of butchering that study. I'd have to go back and read it to give you the exact one, but you have to orient them or you're going to get analysis by paralysis. Now to backtrack one step for, if you don't have cost, you're going to get the, the dreaded, I want to think about it. Let me circle back to this in three months. Okay. So you see how these are all counter to an objection. Money is the resources of willingness to fix the problem. So obviously money helps you defeat the financial objection. And there's two parts to that. There's resources. For, so like, do they physically have the resources? Can they actually do it? You know, if you sell a $50,000 program, and they got $500 in their bank account, the $500 credit score, they don't have the resource, period. Okay. Now, willingness is a little bit different. So willingness means they have the resources, but they're not willing. So for instance, I used to coach a dating coach in sales. I reviewed one of his calls. He was selling an attorney and the attorney had all these dating problems. And, you know, he had the resources, but at the end of the call, he kind of scoffed at investing 5K to really help him find a wife or a girlfriend or whatever. And the reason why is he had the resources he wasn't willing. Now, why wasn't he willing? That ties back into cost, right? So installing the money beliefs creates consistency and which eliminates the financial objections. Then there's support, which means that people around you, close to you, or other stakeholders in the decision support you in fixing the problem. So this is the classic spouse, right? Spouse objection, business partner objection, but it also could be board. It could also be the team that's implementing it. It's any other stakeholders in the decision. So for instance, I was going to buy a program one time and I wasn't going to be the one implementing it. My team was going to be implementing it. So I took the sales call and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the easiest seller of all time. So I was like, oh, this sounds great, but let me just talk to the team who's going to implement it. I want to make sure they're bought in. I went and talked to them and they weren't really bought in. They had a different idea. They also were tapped on their bandwidth. So the, the, the sale was lost. Now, if the sales rep would have potentially gotten that problem, gotten in front of that problem on the call, and then maybe set up a second call to go over that with the stakeholders and the decision and the, and the entire team that was implementing could have been a different outcome. Who knows, right? Then there's trust, right? Trust is the final belief, which means 
trust in your method of fixing the problem. Okay. So an easy way to think about this is we have two sales we're making on every sales call. We have the sale on the method and the sale on the product, right? So the sale on the method is your specific methodology of achieving said desired result. The product is just the product. Okay. Easiest way to think about this. If you guys know who Russell Brunson is, Russell Brunson sells click funnels. And if you ever seen him sell off stage, he actually spends 80 to 90% of his time not selling you on click funnels, but he is selling. It's, it's framed as content. Like you're going to think you're getting content, but what he's really doing is he's selling you on the belief that funnels are the best methodology to be able to attract and get customers online, especially opposed to websites, right? And if you believe, if you're somebody who has a website and you have a glorified brochure, but then you realize it's a glorified brochure, and then you believe the funnels, okay, that's the best way to get customers online, then guess what you're going to do as a natural byproduct of having that belief? You're going to buy click funnels, right? So trust in the method is very, very, very key. All right. So that's trust on your method of fixing the problem. So one thing, if you noticed, is that doubt, cost, desire, money, support, trust, they're all predicated on the problem, right? Pain is the problem. Doubt is the inability to fix the problem. Cost is what happens if they don't fix the problem. Desire is a compelling payoff of fixing the problem. Money is the resources and willingness to fix the problem. Support is what, you know, are the stakeholders close to the decision, support of, and fixing the problem. Trust is their methodology in fixing the problem. So you see how those are all predicated on the problem. That's because in business, business is about solving problems. And if there's, and if, because when you solve a problem, you create value and people exchange money for value. Okay. So we know that to be true. Then sales is really just a demonstration that we can solve a problem for somebody else. But if there's no problem, there's no sale. So on every beginning of the sales call, what we want to do immediately is establish why are they here and what's the gap, the gap between where they are now and where they want to be. Now, what's really key to know is there's two types of problems. Okay. There's a pain and there's an unfulfilled desire. So let me give you an example. I own a equity stake in a stem cell company, right? Most of the people that come in and that are our clients essentially are trying to fix joint pain, which is meaning they're literally in pain and they're trying to go from a below average to average. They're moving away from pain, right? They just want to get back to normal, right? So that's pain. Then there's an unfulfilled desire. So like when I go get stem cells, I'm not really trying to move away from anything. I just want to do it just for general longevity and health benefits. Okay. And maybe like some, some minor tendonitis on my shoulder or something. Okay. So I'm not really trying to go from below average to average. I'm trying to go from average to excellence. Right. And so I'm moving towards something. So it's very, very key to know it's not always like they have to have this big pressing problem. Okay. Because sometimes they don't have a problem, but there's always an unfulfilled desire. Either of those creates the gap, right? The gap between where they are now to where they want to be. So hopefully that makes sense. So with all that being said, that's the philosophy aspect of things. Now let's talk about the call flow. So how do we actually install these beliefs? How do we break down the limiting beliefs? How do we actually reinstall the empowering beliefs? Well, what's really key is what we want to do, especially with these beliefs, is we want to create consistency. So if we can get them to say out loud that they essentially believe these things or things that are representative to that, that they believe those things. What that does is it leverages the most powerful bias of human behavior, which is the consistency bias. So Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, he talks about the number one bias that influences human behavior is consistency or the drive to appear consistent to ourselves and to other people, right? So if we can get people to uh, essentially say what we need to say out loud the consistency bias is going to basically leverage um, leverage us all towards the end of the close, right? It's going to take us all the way to the close because we can't have them basically install these seven beliefs on themselves and at the end start to say something entirely different, right? Because they have to appear to be consistent, okay? So this is why it's all about objection prevention, not objection handling, okay? So how do you actually do that? Well, the call flow, we start off with introduction, and introduction has two parts. There's rapport and frame the call. Then we go into information gathering. That's where we're asking the questions. And that's where most of the seven beliefs are installed. That's where six out of the seven are installed. Then we go into the transition. The transition is just really an effortless, non-salesy way to transition into what we have to offer. What a lot of salespeople do is they do what's called an anvil drop. They start, okay, they do a good job with information gathering. And then they get to the pitch and it's like, 
bam, they like all of a sudden the prospect's like, okay, you were listening to me. Now you're just pitching me. So the transition, the way I teach it, it's very basic and it'll get the prospect to ask you to pitch them. Okay. That's that. I mean, doesn't beat that. So it's very permission based. Then we go into the pitch. All right. Now the pitch is really where we get trust, right? That's that trust in the method of, um, fixing the problem. Okay. So all the other six are in the discovery. Trust is in the pitch and the pitch, the way I explain it, it's not necessarily pitching them on what you are offering and like the deliverables of what you do, even though that's part of it, it's really pitching them and selling them on your method of bridging their current to desired state. Okay. Then we go to the committing phase. The committing phase is essentially just tying them down on the certainty that this is the right thing. Now is the right time. In other words, it's tying them down that they believe your said method is the way to achieve said desired result. And then we go to objection handling at the end, if necessary. So we're going to start with introduction, rapport, and frame the call. So now we're already in some specific scripting. So here's how we start. We say, Hey, is this, I mean, I'm just going to kind of like role play this out loud. It's going to sound a little bit scripted because I don't have a real person to talk to. Okay. But I'm going to do my best. So how do we start the call? And I'm going to frame this as if it's an audio call, even though most of the time, all we do is zoom now, but you know, I grew up the hard way on audio before COVID since COVID everything's been pretty much all zoom. So imagine this is an audio call. Hey, is this John? Hey, John, it's just cool here. What's up? John responds, oh, you know, I'm just doing this. And then I'll just share something with my day. I'll say, awesome. You know, I was actually just working out, you know, getting the pump in, um, you know, and then granted, like that's me, I'm a bro, but uh, get the, getting the pump in. Now I'm talking to you. So super excited to see what you have going on. You know, have a good week so far. Okay. John says something about his week. Oh yeah, I've been having a good week. Just busy. Oh, okay. Is that a good busy or a bad busy? Oh, you know, it's whatever. Just real quick exchange of, of pleasantries. Like we just want to kind of toss the baton back and forth one or two times. And then we want to get into the call. All you want to do with rapport is you want to just establish you are a normal human being and that you're not a uh, overseas um, salesperson who can barely speak English. And this is going to be a really painful conversation. Like you want to establish like, hey, I'm like one of you. And this is going to be a productive, really great conversation. It's you're not going to be talking to a glorified robot. Okay. Uh, we also kind of want to mirror match a little bit. Like we kind of want to get in this natural sync and rhythm with the prospect because some people talk really fast. Some people talk a little bit slower. Some people are from New York. Some people are from down South. Like you kind of have all these different sort of, uh, you know, there's audio, visual, kinesthetic, et cetera. So you want to want to mirror that a little bit. It's a little bit advanced, but then we want to get right into it. It's not about rapport. It is not about trying to be their best friend and just trying to, oh, I got to build all this trust in the beginning of the call. No, like you don't build trust at the beginning of the call by relating to, oh, we have the same favorite baseball team. Okay. You build trust by understanding the problem. All right. That's what really builds trust. Okay. You know, Jay Abraham says, if you can understand the problem and describe the problem better than the prospect can describe it themselves, they automatically think you have the solution. Right. So all the trust is built in the meat of the call, which is the discovery. All right. This is just really to kind of kick things off demonstrate you're a normal human being, have the tonality, et cetera. So anyways, after they've been having a good week so far, I say, great. Well, I know we had a limited amount of time here. So you ready to jump in? You got a clean sheet of paper, something to take notes with? So that's all I'll say. And I uh, mean, not that fast, but that's all I'll say. Now, what I want to do here is I do want to take the lead into always starting the call. That's very, very key. I always want to make sure I'm taking the lead in terms of getting started. The other thing is too, I say, got a clean sheet of paper, something to take notes with. Now, the reason I'm, they're not really going to be taking notes at the beginning of the call. Why do I do that? I want to assess if they're in a buying situation. If I'm on an audio call, so this is great for outbound because outbound will almost always be audio. Um, if I'm on an audio call, I don't know if they're driving. I don't know if they're at their kid's baseball game. I don't know if they're, you know, walking on side. I don't know what's going on. Right. So I have to, like when I ask, do they have a clean sheet of paper something to go with? They will, t if they, if they can't get the paper, right. They're all oh, I'm driving. Oh, I'm, you know, going here. Oh, I'm about to do this. Okay. So it really assesses like where are they at? Cause I want to sit them down into a buying situation. Okay. So that's very, very, very key. Now, if it's zoom, which I recommend zoom anyways, but if it's zoom, then it doesn't really matter because you're gonna be able to see where they're at. Okay. So now if by chance they ever, you know, answer the call and it just seems really off-putting, almost like, um, 
they forgot the call was there or uh, they almost like aren't excited for the call for some reason. They're not expecting it. I always lean out a little bit and I'll say, hey, um, is, is, is now still a good time to connect? And a lot of times when I lean out a little bit, if you can watch me on the screen, if I lean out a little bit, that forces them to come in. Okay. So a lot of times if I ask that, they'll be like, oh yeah, sorry. I just was finishing up a call. I've just had, you know, crazy back-to-backs. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go to the bathroom, come right back. I'll be totally present with you. Okay. So it's just a little bit of a good start opposed to you being this excited salesperson who just wants to rush right into the call. Okay. So report. Now frame, very basic. Do you have to frame the call? No. Okay. However, I think for most beginners, it's really, really good because it gives them essential control and you're really stating at the very, very beginning and letting the prospect know essentially everything you're going to be covering on the call. Okay. And especially in a business context, even though you don't have to do it, a lot of sales trainers will say, oh, it adds sales pressure. I think in a business context, all meetings start with you stating an agenda. Okay. So in that essence, um, I think it's really completely normal. I recommend doing it. I, I generally don't but I'm really good at taking the lead. So I think for most people, until you get to the very advanced level, you frame the call. So here's how you frame the call. You say, gotcha. So, you know, what I really found the work best on these calls is first, let's dive deeper into the specifics of your business and your sales process. So let's talk about like what's working right now, what's not working right now. And ultimately what you feel like are the specific challenges that are keeping you from moving forward. And then once we get some clarity there, if we can help, we can definitely talk about that and go into that if you would like and what we have going on over here. Or if not, we could figure out whatever else is best. You know, I could refer you to somebody I know, maybe assign you some homework. In the meantime, whatever you need. Cool. So that being said, probably our best place to start is what would you say right now is your biggest challenge in your business right now? Or like what's not working at least at the level that it truly feel like it could be that it should. Okay. Now, couple things. Why do we start with that question right at the very, very end? It's because again, business is about solving problems. When you solve problem, you create value. People exchange money for value. So we know that to be true. Sales is really just a demonstration. We can solve a problem for somebody else, right? So we always start with the problem. The entire conversation is going to be around the problem and or the gap. So we start with it right there. Now, what's really, really key here is that, and I'll give you some alternatives to this if this doesn't really apply to what you do, but um, the really, the key here is that if you add, like a lot of people in sales trainers will say, well, you know, you start with asking the biggest challenge. That's like too invasive in the beginning, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. Well, the thing is, in my experience, when you frame it like the way I framed it with this tonality, you will very, very rarely run into resistance whatsoever. So you notice how I said, you know, probably the best place to start is what would you say is the biggest challenge in your business right now? Like what's not working to level truly feel like it could be that it should, right? So when I say challenge, it's almost like, and you know, I'm almost like kind of trying to find the words. Like, I don't even know if that word is like necessarily the best word to be using. And I even say it challenge. Um, and then on top of that, I, I tack on a softener of, or what's not working at the level you truly feel like it could be that it should. Okay. In doing those things, it, it really softens the question. And I will tell you from experience, 99% of the time, they answer it, okay? So now let's go into the discovery flow, right? That question is really the beginning of the discovery flow. But then we're going to go into uh, isolate the problem, background questions, and then the first part of current situation, okay? And this is the first time we've actually looked at this. So the discovery flow essentially goes, we isolate the problem, we get any background questions necessary. So this is like, you know, if it's a business type conversation, you know, you have to know, okay, what's their business? What's their sales process? How do they get clients? What's their price points? What's their terms of their contracts? Like it's just basic logistical stuff. And we knock that out in the beginning, just to sort of knock out some easy questions and sort of get them talking, right? And then we get into current situation. So the first step is we probe the, the problem we isolated. So we just tell me more. We just try to figure that out a little bit. Then what we do is we try, we look at what they're trying to do right now to fix the problem. That's assess current efforts. So what are they trying to do right now to fix the problem? Okay. Then we see how that's working for them. And we do that through a framework call, that's called chunking down. And through chunking down, a lot of times we can qualify them financially. So chunking down really takes the esoteric to specific. Okay. The non-tangible to tangible. Now, 
once we got the problem and we really got a good specific descriptor on it, then what we do is we stretch it. So that's the, how long has this been going on? Then we ask doubt questions, which is what's been keeping you from figuring this out on your own? So how long has this been going on? Okay, it's been going on for five years. What's been keeping you from figuring this out on your own? Solution questions are what have they tried in the past to be able to fix this on their own, right? Or what, you know, what are they invested in? What are they out there trying right now? So, okay, you, you know, you've been trying to fix this for five years. What have you tried in the past to be able to fix this, right? The reason when we ask what's called solution questions is we want to see, are they, have they tried something very similar to ours? Are they working with a competitor? Are they out there talking to a competitor right now? Or have they tried a bunch of stuff that's not like ours that didn't work? And we can use that information to really be able to position our solution differently. Okay. So solution questions are very, very key because they help you tailor your solution to exactly what the prospect needs. And this is very, very key. Write this down. Your solution should be the simultaneous explanation of why everything that you tried in the past has failed and why this is going to be different. So when you're talking about your solution, you really need to bring up the things they've tried in the past, why those things didn't work and why this is going to be different. And by nature, your pitch then becomes educational as well as something that's really getting them bought into your method. Okay. That's very, very, very key. Then once we get out the doubt questions, solution questions, then we really assess why now. Okay. What's going to happen and the thing changes. That's where we get rid of any think about it. Then we go into any spouse partner qualifying if we have to, or business partner, you know, other stakeholders, et cetera. So that's current situation. Then we go into desired, which with desired, we want to know ultimately what's their goal, like what's their vision. We want to know the monetary goal, right? So if it's like a business thing, right? Let's say they want more leads. How many more leads do they want? If they want more revenue, how much more revenue do they want exactly? Now, if it's dating, you know, how many dates do they want to go on, right? Or um, what type of partner specifically are they looking to try to find? If it's weight loss or some sort of health health thing, uh, what's the target weight they want to be at? So when we paint their desired situation, we always want to find a way to assign a number to it, a data point, okay? Then we'll go into non-monetary goals. So non-monetary goal, again, in a business example, that's going to be really how does this impact other areas of the life? So how would getting to this desire impact other areas of their life, maybe their relationships or maybe their health or whatever. I'll teach you how to ask that question in a way that's not uh, salesy. Because a lot of people will just say, well, how does this impact other areas of your life? It doesn't really work that well. Now, a non-monetary goal, if it's a non-monetary offer, what I mean by that is you just want to attach something to another area of their life. So let's say it's a weight loss thing. We can attach it to self-esteem. You can attach it to dating. Okay. Or sorry. Um, you know, you can attach it to self-esteem, weight loss could be attached to better sex life, better energy, better work performance, etc. So you just want to take that desire and just really help them well-round it so they can see really like holistically how it's going to affect everything. So let's chunk this down and get into the specifics. So again, we asked what's the biggest challenge right now or like what's not working, but literally feel like it could be that it should. Now, once they say what they say, you want to just use some common sense and probe a little bit. Okay. Tell me more. When you said blank, what do you mean exactly? Uh, now, if the biggest challenge question doesn't really apply to you, you could just say, hey, you know, so what prompted you about the ad that you received that prompted you to read, or what did you see about the ad that prompted you to really reach out? Okay. Now, background questions again, you know, if it's a business, what problem are you solving? For whom are you solving for? What's your price? What's your acquisition system, et cetera? So again, we want to start with either that challenge question, probe a little bit, or like, hey, you know, what prompted you to really take and want to take this call? Reach out or want to take this call? Then, then you can dig into that a little bit as well. All right. So um, now let me just say right here, if let's say like, uh, you know, if you're selling PR services, this is a really great example of like, you can't really ask, well, what's the biggest challenge with your PR right now? A lot of times, because like, there's really no challenge. Okay. So you would say, what about the ad prompt you to reach out? Now, what, let's just say they say, yeah, I just wanted to see what you got. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I'm more than prepared to share with you a little bit about what we got going on over here. The thing is, everything's all customized. So I think instead of going over you know, a two hour long call of every single little different thing we've done for every single little different client, uh, I think at this stage, what probably is going to be the most appropriate next step is let's see kind of what your PR looks like right now and what you're doing, if anything, for PR. And then based on that, I can tell you how our service would be tailored for you 
specifically in a much shorter time frame. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So what are you doing for PR right now, if anything? And then you go into that, right? What they're using, how that's going, et cetera. All right. So anyways, just wanted to give a little example there. So quick note on probing questions here. Here's a few you can use. Tell me more. When you said blank, what do you mean? Why do you say that though? Uh, a good one is, uh, a good one is, has that put you in a tough position? Yeah. In, in, in what way though? Okay. I love that question. Um, has that put you in a little bit of a bind cash flow wise? In, in, in what way though? I got that one from Jeremy Miner. So it's a good one as well. Now, discovery flow. So here again, what we're getting into is we're getting into now assessing the current efforts, right? We isolated the problem. We probed, we got some background questions. Now we're going to assess current efforts and chunk down. All right. So I want to give you a business example. This part is really hard unless I get to teach, unless I give you an example. Okay. And it's also the part where there's the most variance within the sales process. But basically what we want to do is we have this problem. Okay. Like let's say it's lead generation in the business example. Lead generation is not tangible. Okay. We can't touch it. We can't describe it. We can't paint a picture of it. So we want to take it from the intangible to concrete. Okay. We want to make it specific and we want to be able to touch it. All right. So here's how that would look. Gotcha. So you mentioned lead generation is your biggest issue right now. Um, so how are you currently generating leads currently? Right now you might ask a few probing questions after that. How is that working for you? Do you like it? Oh, what do you like about it? What would you change if you couldn't though? Right? So once you establish what the problem is, it's always, well, what are you trying to do right now? What's the current behavior to trying to fix the problem? How is that working? What would you change if you could? Basic probing. Then we get into the really good stuff, which is chunking down. So I'll say something like, okay, gotcha. So, you know, you're trying, let's say it's a real estate agent. I'll say, okay, gotcha. Uh, or let's say it's a coach. Um, so, okay. So, you, you know, your biggest thing is lead generation right now for your coaching. You're trying a little bit of Facebook, a little bit of organic Instagram. Let's just see how that's working because you're kind of doing a lot. So last week specifically, how many sales calls did you generate? Uh, one. Oh, okay. What about the week before? Uh, two. Okay, great. And, and now you mentioned your ideal client is X, Y, Z, right? And again, you just got their ideal client in the background section, right? So you redescribe their perfect client that they really want. You just mentioned a second ago, your ideal client is X, Y, Z. How many of those three, the, out of those three sales calls that you got, how many of those fit the perfect bill of the exact ideal client you really want to attract? You know what they're going to say? Zero, right? Oh, okay. Well, why do you think that is? Okay. And then, you know, they'll kind of stumble a little bit. Okay, well, let me give you a little bit of insight based on our experience, really helping people develop this. So generally, if you're getting a lot of sales calls and it's not the people you want in the first place, it's one of two things. It's either the messaging, so like the messaging you're putting out to the marketplace or the targeting or the platform that you're using. So which one of those do you think is having more of an impact on you? Okay, in what way though, right? So again, you could see how I did a little education there, built a little bit of authority and then sort of gave them the answer that I want to give them and let them respond on it, which is going to be something I'm going to address in the solution. Okay. So out of those qualified leads, um, or I would say in this example, you know, they had three, right? Out of the three leads, how many did you close? Okay. Just one. All right. So two of you didn't close. What was the reason you didn't close them? I mean, again, were they just not qualified or was it a breakdown in the sales process? Oh, they just weren't qualified. Oh, okay, great. Well, we talked about that. Now, what price point did you close them at? Okay. You closed, you closed one at 5k. Now, so you made 5K last month or what did you make last month? So you see how that naturally led into what their business revenue is. So you made 5K last month or what did you make last month? No, I made 5K. Gotcha. Now, was that all collected or like, what did you collect up front? Oh, I collected about $2,500 up front. Gotcha. Now, was that pure profit or what's your profit margin on that? Oh, about 80%. Okay, great. So you made about uh, 2250 last month. Cool. And are you the sole owner or what does your leadership structure look like? Because a lot of times you chunk it all the way down. Now we're at 2250 and then it's like, well, what does your leadership structure look like? Well, you know, I have a business partner. Okay. Are you guys splitting that 50, 50? Okay. Gotcha. So you took about 1200 bucks home last month. All right. And then from there, what we would ask is can I ask, and, and, and so can I ask you a personal question? Um, you know, obviously like that, that's not enough to probably pay the bills in any state in the United States. So, um, is that putting you in a tough position financially or like, are you working a nine to five or what, what's, what's happening there? Oh yeah. It's tough. In what way though? Oh yeah, I'm working a nine to five. Oh, okay. Well, how long has that been going on for? So you see how I really took this esoteric and it's like, 
I'm just drilling down. And now they're almost like roadkill. And I don't mean to say they're roadkill. I'm like, I'm going to take advantage of them, right? It's, it's just that now, like, really what's going on is out in the open. Because well, people will tell you stories about their problems, but the truth is always in the numbers, okay? Now, again, when I asked how many calls did you generate last week, what's really great about that is a lot of times, if their problem is lead generation, it's barely, oh, you know. So they'll tell you about all this stuff and lead generation that they're doing. And then it's like, how many calls last week? One. Okay, what about last week, the week before? Two. Okay, well, what about last month as a whole? Uh, five. And then you do the perfect client thing. Well, you mentioned your perfect client is somebody blank, 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 blank. How many of those five calls were that person? Zero, you know? And so it really helps them see and like put out into the open how bad their problem really is. This makes sense, okay? It's almost the same reason why people don't like to look at their bank statements. They don't like to check their bank accounts every day. They don't want to see how bad it really is. So you got to help like, you know, they have all these skeletons in the closet. You got to kind of open the closet. You got to pull out the skeletons. And you got to say like, look, like, you know, here it is. You got to look at this. All right. And that's what really gets them to change. Now, let's go. We kind of went over this a little bit. Um, let's move on to, and, and, and so once we establish like, boom, like we hit that emotional pain point and we kind of got to the bottom of this, then we go on to, okay, well, how long has this been going on for? Okay. And we'll, so we'll talk about that section in a second. I'm going to give you a fitness coaching example. So this one's non ROI. Okay. Non, uh, money related. So, um, gotcha. So you mentioned consistency. Let's say that you isolated the challenge and the person says their biggest problem is following a diet consistently. Okay. So you mentioned consistency in a certain diet, it, it, you know, is really the biggest challenge right now. Can you give me an example of how that shows up? All right. So ask for an example. All right. They give you an example. Okay, well, take me back to the last time, whatever they said, actually happened. Like, walk me through that experience end to end exactly what happened, right? Now, that that pain that they had to give you an example of, them walking you through that experience, guess what they're doing? By the nature of them telling you about that experience, guess who else they're telling? Themselves, right? And in doing so, they're bringing back all the emotions associated with that experience of failure, really, which are, guess what? The emotions of change, right? So again, really good chunking down there. Now, what we'll say is, okay, now, well, let's walk through your current meal plan, like starting with yesterday. So what do you have for breakfast? Okay, then what about any snacks? Okay, what about lunch? What about dinner? And so you're walking them through like what they're eating and how many calories did you eat yesterday? Okay, they're, they're not gonna know. Now, this is, I wrote this for like flexible dieting, so they're big on calories. You know, you'd have to tailor, if you have a different methodology, you have to tailor it for something else. But you know, with the whole calories piece, they're not gonna know. Okay. Then when they give you the breakfast, lunch, snacks, whatever, you don't judge them or anything. You just don't say anything. Okay. Because they're going to be thinking to themselves, is this good? Is this bad? They'll start to overqualify. Yeah. Like well, I had this, but it's this on the pad, you know? And, and so they're, they're sitting in the weight of their pain a little bit and they're becoming a little bit insecure about their current behaviors of trying to fix the problem. Again, you're not judging them. This is just coming up naturally for themselves. Okay. And gotcha. And what's your dream weight? Like, where do you really want to be? Okay. And how far are you away from that right now? All right. So I always associate it with a goal first. And then I say, okay, and how far are you away from that right now? Okay, great. So you weigh 200 pounds right now. Right. So I always confirm. So that's a little bit of an easier way to go about it. So then what we want to do is now we kind of chunked it all down. We want to attach it to an emotional pain point. So then we will say is now let's look at your energy and performance. So like on a scale of one to 10, one being like, okay, I don't feel good at all. And 10 being, you know, I could basically run the New York marathon. All right. What would you say is like your day-to-day -day energy on a scale of one to 10? So what you'd see I did here on the scale of one to 10 is I weighted it ones I don't feel good and 10's New York marathon. So it's going to skew lower. All right. So that is a little bit of a, you know, tactical thing there. Um, they say a four. All right. Okay. So four. All right. So you're at a four. And uh, if I can ask, what do you do for work right now? Okay, cool. So you do, you know, X, Y, Z, let's say it's something that's construction, right? Can I ask you a personal question? I mean, you do construction, like that's super hands-on. And, you know, you mentioned you're a four. So like you're at 40% of really where your energy could be and it should be. So, um, you know, again, like if I can ask, does that impact you at work? Being at 40% of the energy you really could be that it should be? And, yeah. In, in, in what way though? You know, walk me through, like, what do you think exactly would happen if you were able to show up at 100%, 10 out of 10 every single day? 
okay, can you give me an example? Like what would happen? So you see here how I basically took that and now I'm associating it with like, maybe they're going to get a promotion. Maybe they're going to, you know, I, I don't know what they're going to say, but this is one of those things where sometimes you can get the ROI financially here. Oh, I could get a promotion. I'd be able to think clear. I wouldn't have brain fog, right? Now you can tie these things back into the solution. How it's not just about weight loss. It's about a lifestyle development that you're doing here. Okay. So very, very key. You can also do the same skill of 10 thing with um, body confidence, uh, sex life, you know, stuff like that. If you would like, you know, it really depends on what you're comfortable with and what fits your, um, your sales and style the best. So that was the probe assess current efforts, chunk down financial qualifier, right? Now, oh, and by the way, with the fitness example, when you figure out what they do for work, that acts as the financial qualifier. Generally in fitness, you, you just want to see what they do for work. Okay. And, and generally that's lets you know kind of if they can do it or not. Um, now, so once we've really gotten everything out in the open, right, we've assigned numbers, we got specific examples, et cetera. Then we say, how long has this been going on? And we go to the rest of the stuff. So here's this framework. So say, gotcha. So, you know, right now, and I'll recap their situation right now, you know, it, lead generation is the biggest thing. You're trying this, this, and this. Really not getting a lot of volume. And a big thing is you feel like you're advertising on the wrong places. And we really only had five sales calls last last month. We closed one. Okay. So obviously, like lead generation is the bottleneck. How long has this been going on for? Okay. So now you see how this just stretches it. All right. Cool. And and so what have you tried in the past to be able to fix this, if anything? All right. Um, have you been out there looking for other potential ways to insert desired outcome? Have you been out there looking for other potential ways to really apply a flexible dieting approach to your lifestyle? Okay, well, well what have you looked into? Have you tried, uh, any, have you tried to gotten any one-on-one -on -one or personal coaching in the past? Okay, what did that look like? So with solution-based questions, which is what the ones I just did, we want to see again, what are, what are they looking into right now? What have they tried in the past? Have they tried anything similar to us? Because my solution, I really want to tailor it and it's a simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past failed, why this is going to be different. All right. Then I'll say, okay, well, what do you think has been keeping you from fixing this on your own? Um, after that, this is a very key framework. Okay. I'll say this is all one question. All right. So I go, well, how long did all the things they try to do with fix in the past? And then I'll say, Hey, now, um, can I ask you a personal question? I mean, you know, you've been at this for like five years now and you know, you tried this, you tried this, you tried this, you tried this. You know, like if I can ask, um, you know, what has you keeping on, keeping on opposed to throwing in the towel? Like, I really commend you for like the effort and, and being out there and being even on this call, really trying to address this. Um, you know, what's driving you? Like, why is this so important to you now though? Okay. So what I did here is I said, can I ask you a personal question, right? Permission increases compliance, right? Also compliance is the answers you get, right? So now when I say, can I ask you a personal question also presupposes a personal response, right? So more compliance. Then I say, I build context. So it's called permission context question. So the context is you've had this for five years. You've tried all these things. What as you keep it on, keep it on, right? And when I paint that context, what's happening is they're going to start to justify their behavior because of that consistency bias. So you're going to get really great compliance with this answer. The issue with most people when they ask, why is this so important to you? Is just that they just ask, why is this so important to you? And the, and the prospect kind of knows like, well, you're just asking me that, you know, it, it's kind of salesy, right? When you frame it in all of this context interweaved within the conversation and all these things they've already told you, they really want to justify their behavior. And so they'll actually tell you why it's so important to you. It's just a better, better way to ask it. Now you let them respond. And then if you don't really think of a good response, you say this, you say, hmm, well, um, I guess that makes sense. Um, is there any other reason this is important to you now though? And that's called the any other reason question, right? So a lot of times people have two reasons for doing things. It's they have the reason that sounds good and then the real reason, right? So for instance, um, you know, I reviewed a call where a sales rep said this to somebody who wanted to start an Amazon business. So it was like a biz op offer. And you know, the person said this, all these reasons why he wanted to start his business, blah, 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 blah. It was very surface level. So the sales rep asked this question and he said, you know, like, I just recently got a divorce and my wife never believed in me and I want to prove her wrong. And so is that a good reason or a bad reason? I don't know. I'll leave that up to you, but it was his reason right now. 
him saying that, more importantly, telling himself on the sales call and reliving all those emotions, guess what those emotions are? The emotions of change, right? So again, then I'll say, can I ask you another personal question? Yup. Okay. And I really hate to ask this, but like, what's your plan if nothing changes? You know, what if the last five years are like the next five years? So again, that one is like, sometimes you, you can pull that one, but that one is like the, the, the nail in the coffin generally. So, um, the last thing we'll do here is we'll say, are you married? Do you have a family? And then, uh, or like, are you have a business partner? And we'll say, is your partner supportive of you trying to blank? Is your, like, let's say the business partner, is your business partner supportive of you trying to solve your lead generation issues right now? Uh, do they know you're on this call? Oh, they don't know you. Okay. What would they think if they knew you're on this call? Okay. So you can see how that works as well. Uh, this is really key because since we outlined all of the, uh, it, you know, we're not asking, is your partner supportive of you making decisions on your own? Or we, we outlined this big change the prospect wants to make. And then we're saying, is your partner supportive of you making that change? Okay. Big difference. So um, now we're going to go on to desired situation. I want to roll through this pretty quickly, but we're going to cover the ultimate goal, monetary, long-term vision, non-monetary. So um, now we're going to get into more exciting stuff, right? And we always want to leave discovery on a positive note. Like we're, we're not like doing this against the prospect. We're doing it for them. So got it. Well, we talked a little bit about where you want to be, but ultimately what's the goal, right? We leave that way open-ended. They just tell us whatever comes up. Then we assign a target. So if it's business, we'll say, okay, well, what's the monetary goal? Or if it's weight loss, I'll say, gotcha. And like, what's really the target weight if we haven't gotten that yet? All right. So now generally with people's targets, people will know what it is. So let's say you ask the business owner, you know, what's the target for your real estate business? 30K a month. Oh, well, it, it seems like you, you thought of that before. Um, if I can ask, like, why that number? So you can see how, again, instead of you saying, okay, well, John, why is that number important to you though? What I'm doing is I'm pointing out what could be perceived as inconsistency in their behavior and asking them to justify that behavior to me. That gives me more compliance. All right. Now, um, this one right here, this financial qualifier, if it's like something where it's like a biz op type of thing, right? Like, let's say they want to start their coaching business full time, but they're working nine to five right now. I'll ask, okay, great. Well, how much money do you have to make just to replace the amount of income that you're making full time? Right. This is a way to ask how much money are you making full time? without asking how much money you're making at full time and it coming off invasive. Okay. How much money would you have to make just to replace the amount of income you're making full time? I framed it as a goal we're going to achieve together. And so they'll say, oh, you know, 6K a month. Gotcha. So you're making 6K a month right now. Right. So um, then we're going to move on to long-term vision. You know, it's more of a business one. Now this one, I'm going to frame it as a business, but we want to like, if it's a business thing, we want to attach it to another area of their life on the vision, the same way we did for the pain. So I'll say again, now can I ask a personal question. And you know, the reason why I'm asking this is because my goal is to really not just help you build a business that's building you wealth, but also one that's empowering you to live a lifestyle that you want to live. So when you think about that, what is that for you? Like what comes up? What are the non-monetary goals, the personal goals you want your business to allow you to achieve? All right. So what I did again here is permission reason why question, right? We already talked about permission, more compliance. Then I say the reason why I'm asking the question, but I frame the reason why I'm asking the question in their own benefit, which it is. Okay. So that's called a moral authority frame, which increases compliance. Then I ask the question. All right. So now we're getting into transition. So transition here is after we've gotten all the information that we feel like we need, we're going to say, look, well, you know, I don't have any more questions. Is there Anything else you feel like we haven't covered that you feel like I need to know, right? So what you're doing here is they're going to say, no, I feel like you totally understand my situation. And in sales, it's not about the questions you ask. It's about the answers that you get. So instead of doing this long recap and it's like, you know, you just read your entire freaking thing in notes and, you know, you, you're like this dancing monkey and the, and the prospect's like, oh, you know, good job, Johnny. You, you, you got me. Like, you understand, like. I just asked a sentence and then get the same exact response of like, oh yeah, you totally get my situation. I feel like we talked about everything. Cool. So then I will say, okay, well, John, um, based on what you told me previously, we can definitely help. Okay. Now in this inserts thought section, what I'll say is, so for instance, 
you know, we worked with a client a year ago, it was in the same situation. You know, I'll, I'll talk about a story of why we can help or a case study or something from my personal experience of why I think we can help. I just want to justify with some proof that we can definitely help, just like I said, we were going to. Then once I'm done with that, I'll say, that said, where do you think we should go from here? You know, we can, I can walk you through basically the entire process A to Z if you would like, but you tell me where you want to go. So this is called, I, I don't even know what I call this, the hamburger sandwich question or something. Uh, I just made this up, but what I found is you say, where do you think we should go from here? So it's question, suggestion, question. That's what it's called. Where do you think we should go from here? I can walk you through the process A to Z if you would like, but you tell me where you want to go. And what they're going to do is you're basically asking them where they want to go from here. But since you're giving them that suggestion in the middle, they always take the suggestion. Now, just to make sure you don't ask it like this, okay? Because when I see people implement this and it doesn't work, this is what they do wrong. They say, well, um, where do you think we should go from here? You know, um, I can walk you through everything if, if you want, but like, you, you tell me where you want to go. Yeah, like, you know, like, don't say that. Like, if you say it like that, it's just not going to work, okay? You, you got to have good tonality and it's got to be a direct command. Like, you're still in the leadership role, but you're asking where they want to go and they're making a suggestion. They'll always say, yeah, like, walk me through A to Z. I would love to hear about everything you got. Now, even if they say here, um, yeah, I, you know, I want to know the price, the deliverables, how it works, nuts and bolts, right? you just still move on and you just tell them the offer. Like you just still move on to what's going to be next. Um, so pretty much no matter what they say, you still go on to the next point, but this gives them the illusion of control. Like they, they, they feel like during control of the call in the situation. So now we get into the pitch. Okay. So the pitch works out like this. There's a couple parts. There's the high level promise. There's the bridge and there's the delivery. So the high level promise is ultimately what we're going to achieve. The bridge is the method. Right? So that's the milestones we're going to accomplish. What we're going to get done on the way of getting there. The delivery is like how it's actually going to happen. Like we're going to have this amount of one-on-one -on -one calls, this amount of Facebook groups, et cetera. The main part is the high-level promise and the bridge. Delivery is very, very low part of it. Now with the bridge, what we do is we typically pitch our offer and three to four pillars, milestones, uh, steps, et cetera. All right? The first two are the paradigm shift. So the first two, what we do is our, the, the first two pillars are really the simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is going to be different. Okay. Pillar three is typically future pacing them after they already accomplished what they want to accomplish. Same with pillar four. So we'll give you an example here. So high level promise. Here's how it works. I'll say, gotcha. Well, you still have that pen and pad. Why am I asking that again? They might've gotten up and walked off, gotten in the car, whatever. I want to assess if they're in a buying situation and sit them back down. Then I'll say, great. Well, on your pen and pad, write out one through four, okay? With a good amount of space in between, all right? One, two, three, four. And then you shut up. Like you actually, because they will not do it at first. And then what's funny is like, if you pause it for like four seconds, you'll see them like start shuffling and getting the paper and like, they're like, oh, one, two. So you just wait, okay? Then here's the high level promise. You say, gotcha. Well, let me preface this by saying like everything we do for clients is all customized basically on what's best for the client. For you, specifically, it's going to be four things, four things to help you go from current to desired. So we'll say four things to help you go from a real estate business right now, where you're at about 10 K a month, no inconsistent, a very inconsistent lead flow to where you're not only getting the consistent lead flow, but it's with the high end listens in their area that you really want. And you really have all the foundations and everything you need to be able to eventually hit 50 K a month, not more. Okay. So we, we state and we, we state back to them basically what they told us that they wanted. Right. So then, um, did I skip here? Okay. So then once we do that, we'll say, cool. So when you come in, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to help you build out your, and then it's pillar one. Now here's the framework of what you want to do here. You say, look, when it comes to desired outcome, here's the problem. Most people out there in X, Y, and Z market, they're trying to do incorrect behavior. And because of that, they end up having problem and ultimately consequences of that problem. So that's called problem licking. I'm going to give you an example of this is a little like formulaic. Okay. It is formulaic. It's formula. So instead, what we do is feature, which allows you to benefit and ultimately benefit of that benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. What are your thoughts on that? So key things here. What we do here is number one, we do an us versus them frame. 
When it comes to desired outcome, here's the problem. Most people out there are trying to do incorrect behavior. And what it does is problem linking. So incorrect behavior leads to problem and ultimately consequence. So instead, what we do, us versus them frame, okay? See, is feature that allows you to benefit and ultimately benefit of that benefit. So it's benefit linking, okay? Now, also, what I do with all of these pillars is I'll either say, hey, you know how earlier on the call you told me this and it was making you this, right? Well, the problem with that is this. Okay, so instead, what we do is blank. So either through explaining what most people are doing wrong or maybe what they did wrong in the past, I'm explaining how I'm always setting up how my solution is going to be different. Because again, I really want them to hear my solution and have this epiphany of, oh, like, here's why I failed in the past and this is why this is going to be different. Okay? So, uh, simultaneous explanation. Another key thing about this is you want to incorporate as much discovery as you can. You want to give some multiple forms of proof and you want to do a double tie down. So I always say, does that make sense? They say, yes. What are your thoughts on that? And I don't do that on every single pillar, like four times in a row, but definitely the first one or two, I always do that. You want to make your pitches, not an anvil drop. You do not want to say, hold your questions at the end. And I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you about everything. And then it's like, you know, just gives you all this information. And then you just get this, like, it's almost like when you watch a PowerPoint and there's like, it's just really, really boring. And you're just like, oh, like you're just like fading, you know, um, you don't want that, right? What you want instead is more of a dialogue around the offer. So a good rule of thumb is every 45 seconds, check in. Does that make sense? Cool. Are you, are, are you picking up what I'm putting down? Okay. What are your thoughts on that? You know, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to give you an example here. All right. And so this would be for a coach who wants to grow their business. Right. And maybe I think, uh, oh yeah. So it's a coach who wants to grow their business. It's like a huge block of text probably hard to read, but a coach who wants to grow their business and they think the problem is their ads, but it's actually their offer. Right. So I'll say, Hey, so when you come in, the very first thing we're going to do with you is help you dial in what we call a productized offer. So when it comes to getting, dialing in paid traffic, here's the issue. Most coaches out there, they're completely focused on their ads and funnels when in reality, it's actually their offer. So what ends up happening is they spend a ton of money on ads, they test all this targeting, they test all this bidding strategies, but they waste a lot of money because ultimately they're trying to build their house on a foundation of sand. Does that make sense? Cool. So instead, what we do is we first take you through our offer intensive to help you build an offer that's positioned as unique, different, superior than your competitors in the marketplace. So when you do that, not only your ads are going to work, but you'll also be able to charge a premium pricing. When you can charge premium pricing, you have more cash flow, which makes ads even easier. Does it make sense? Cool. What are your thoughts on that? So like I just wrote this a second ago and it needs a little edit. So I just wrote this a second ago and you know, this probably needs a little bit of work, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of example here. So, um, Anyways, let's move on. So at pillars two and four, you just continue that process, okay? Typically, the pillars one and two are going to be the big insights with heavier tie downs. Then three and four are just kind of future pacing after one and two is accomplished. One and two is really what they want. Three and four is we just kind of future pace. So in general, for that one, it's like if, if you're a coach and it's a, it's a you know, uh, a coaching growth offer, grow your coaching business offer. Typically, the first thing is really dialing in the offer. The second thing is going to be something around lead generation. The third thing is, okay, once we figure those out, what's the next problem? It's going to be building a sales team or building team or uh, building a sc scalable client system because you got to fix the problem created by what you just uh, accomplished, right? Because if you have leads and you're closing them and your offer is really good, then what's going to happen is you're going to have fulfillment issues. You're going to have scalability issues. Or you're going to need a sales team. So you're going to fix the problem created by really the solution. Right. And then you do the same thing. But when you're doing that, you're future pacing them. They can see themselves going through those steps themselves. So now we're to go into the committing phase. Right. So what we do here is after we cover those four things, we ended off by saying, cool. So like, what questions do you have about those four things we covered specifically? Right. Then we start answering all their questions. Now, what's really key here is you want to answer in two sentences or less, or preferably like one word. So they ask a question, you say, absolutely. They ask a question, you answer in one sentence. And then you say, does that make sense? Or do you say, does that answer your question? Cool. What's next? What other questions? So that's a very, very key thing here is you answer the questions very briefly. And then you end off by saying, 
Does that answer your question? Cool. What's next? What are the questions? That keeps you in the lead and allows you to still drive the call without the prospect taking over, but still while giving all their answers question or all their questions answered. So we do that. Now a key thing here is there might be opportunities in which they ask a question and you don't really know why they're asking the question. And there's a hidden objection behind the question. So in general, let's say they ask, so is this all group coaching? What you want to say is, well, there's group elements to what we do, but just so I can best answer your question, is there a specific reason why you're asking? Oh yeah, because I was in a group coaching program before and it was like horrible and it took so long and blah, 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 blah. And like, I can never get my question answered. So I just really don't want that again. Oh, okay. Got it. And then I can respond in a way that, see how that uncovered the objection? I can respond in a way that it addresses the objection. But I would have sort of said, oh yeah, it's group coaching. Boom, lost the sale. So just remember, okay, is there a specific reason why you're asking that question? Right? Very key. So after we answer all the questions, then we say, cool, well, how do you feel? So how do you feel about the process specifically? Right? So what we're doing is those four things we covered, what we want to do is see if that's what they need to get to X, Y, and Z. It gets a desired result. So we're getting that trust, remember? We're buying in on the methodology. So we'll say, cool, how do you feel? Like, how do you feel about the process specifically? Do you feel like it's what you need to get your real estate business to X, right? Now, if they give you a certain answer with a certain tonality, then what you do is you move on. So if they're like, absolutely, dude, I've been looking for this. Like, we really need to do this. Okay, great, you just move on. If they say something like, if they say no, or if they say more commonly, well, I think so, right? I take that as a no. So like I typically just call it out, be like, I, I think so. So like, gotcha. So like, obviously like there's probably something, you know, we're not completely understanding or like maybe I skipped over some stuff and I just didn't explain it correctly. So, you know, what's really important to us is alignment. You know, when you come in working with us, you know, our team is all in, we work with you in the trenches on this thing. So we just really want to make sure you feel good about the process. You know what I mean? So just to be hundred percent clear, like on a scale of one to 10, one being like, I hate this guy when I get off the boat. And 10 being like, yep, that's exactly what I need. Where do you feel like you fall out exactly? Right? Now, generally, it, you know, if you get a six or below, they're probably not going to close. You messed up something earlier. If they give a nine or a 10 and certain language tonality, you move on. If they give it eight or a nine, you say, cool. Well, you know, I appreciate you being honest with about, about that. Just curious, what do you think's keeping you from being an eight, nine, or a 10? Or what do you think's keeping you from being a 10? Right? Um, so, you know, that gives you an opportunity to address any objections about the methodology, right? About the process before you move on the price, because once you get to the investment, what happens is everything's off the table. If they're uncertain at all, it's done, right? We have to get them bought in and hundred percent certain that your methodology is what they need to get to said result before we get there. Okay. So then what we do is once we go over questions and we do the temp check, we say, we kind of read a little, little recap. So we'll say, gotcha. So you feel really good. No questions. Um, what's next? Where do you want to go from here? Guess what they're going to do? They're going to ask for the investment. So here's what you do with the investment. You pitch it like this. You say, so you'll, so basically the next steps, you'll process the investment with me. Uh, once we take care of that, what we'll do is going to set up an onboarding call. We'll give you some homework on the onboarding call. We'll basically look over when we're going to meet, how we're going to meet, how often we're going to meet things we're going to give you, things we need you to do, things we're going to do for you or assets we're going to give you. Basically, everything's going to be laid out step by step by step by step. So you have complete clarity and certainty on what's going to happen over the next 12 weeks. Does that sound good? Okay, perfect. And then the investment is just blank, right? So what I do is I explain what's going to happen after after they give give us the money, right? After they invest, so that builds certainty of like, what's going to happen next. So they start visualizing themselves doing that. And then I say, and then the investment is blank. And then you shut up. Now, if it gets weird, where it's like this long pause, and you're just like, like, you know, staring at each other on Zoom, you can just say, how do you feel? But the key is, if that if there's an awkward pause, generally, what happens is, you are going really, 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 really fast. And then you drop the investment and then you just shut up. So like you're going really, really fast. So like when you drop the investment, they're kind of figuring you're going to keep talking because you're going really, really fast. So intentionally, what you want to do is start slowing down when you get closer to this. Okay. And then they're naturally going to probably fill in the gap themselves. 
But if you were Speedy Gonzalez, if you did an anvil drop and then you go to the investment, just psh, like they're almost going to laugh at you. And it is, it is kind of funny. But if you do get in a weird situation where like they're not saying anything, I don't like, I, I don't do a Mexican standoff with who's going to talk after price. I just say, how do you feel? Right? That's what I want to hear. 